Welcome to worship at Northfield United Methodist Church on the second Sunday of Lent. My name is Pastor Rachel McIver Morey, and I couldn't be more delighted to welcome you. If you're watching during one of our 9.30 a.m. watch parties on Sunday morning, please let us know you're here either in Facebook or in online.church. It is so good to know who is joining us. Come, and I pray that the love of God walks with you today. Rebel against your love, O God. Your will be done, O Lord. We confess our sin. Your will be done, O Lord. We repent in dust and ashes. Your will be done, O Lord. We receive grace. Your will be done, O Lord. We stand ready to obey. Your will be done, O Lord. Your will be done, O Lord, in us, in spite of us, and around us. Today's prayer comes to us from appleseeds.org and is attributed to Jack Reamer. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. We cannot merely pray to you, O oh God, to end war, for we know that you have made the world in a way that man must find his own path to peace within himself and his neighbor. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end starvation, for you have already given us the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to root out prejudice, for you have already given us eyes with which to see the good in all people if we would only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end despair, for you have already given us the power to clear away despair and give hope if we would only use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end disease, for you have already given us great minds with which to search out cures and healing if we would only use them constructively. Therefore, we pray to you instead, O God, for strength, determination, and willpower to do instead of just pray, to become instead of merely to wish. Lord, it is we, the part of the body of Christ called Northfield United Methodist Church, that knows that we can pray and knows that we can act and knows that all we can do, we can do because of the goodness that you are and the goodness in which you have made your people. Lord, we come before you in prayer this morning holding so many in our hearts, holding people who we know, people whom we've seen, people in our community, our nation, and our world. In this coming silence, Lord, hear our prayers, prayers that acknowledge the opportunities we each have for action, but prayers that seek, in each case, your presence, your power, and your direction. In the silence, Lord, hear us, and in the silence, Speak to us.
We cannot merely pray to you, O God, but we can pray to you, O God. And we can pray the way that you have instructed us to pray. As we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi kids, it's Pastor Rachel, and it's time for our children's moment. And today we're going to talk about what it means to, that something is holy, something is special, something is different from the other things like it. So I brought this guitar. Now maybe to you it just looks like an ordinary guitar. Maybe it looks like a lot of guitars you've seen. But this is a Taylor guitar, number one. Kind of a good brand. It's, it plays real nice. Um, but the real reason it's special to me is because it's the last guitar my dad ever gave me. Now, my dad has given me lots of guitars over the years. This was something that we used to do together. Um, but this is the last one he gave me. And uh, I, this is the kind of guitar where I'm having trouble even changing the strings on it. Um, they badly, badly need to be changed. But my dad put these on, so I'm having a hard time with that. But this guitar is special because my dad gave it to me. So this is the kind of guitar that um, if I have it out in the house, I'm telling the kids, uh-uh-uh, don't touch that one. Which is fine because my dad had like a bazillion guitars and they can have three that they can mess with. But this one is different and so I keep it set apart. And that's part of what it means to have something that is holy. It's set apart. It's different. It has a story. We tell about it. Let me give you another example here. Coming on the screen, you're going to see a picture of me ankle deep in the Sea of Galilee. This picture was taken last January when I took a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And the Sea of Galilee is this giant lake, or it's the biggest lake in that geographical region, certainly, the largest freshwater body. And this lake, this sea, is a place where so much of Jesus' ministry happens. So this is the sea where when Jesus uh, went out on the boat with the disciples, he calmed the storm that came up on the lake and the disciples were scared. This is the sea where the disciples were out fishing and Jesus hollered out, Hey, have you tried the other side of the boat? And they said, No. And Jesus said, You should try it. And then the disciples fished on the other side and got a bunch of fish. This is the sea where Jesus uh, sat on the on the. Um, on the shore and taught the crowds and talked about the uh, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is the place where Jesus did all those things. It's amazing. What makes this place special, what makes it holy, what makes it set apart, isn't that when I put my ankles in the water, suddenly I got magic powers or anything like that. What makes it special are the things that happen there and the stories we tell about the place. So I wonder for you, do you have anything in your house or where you're living? Or do you have any place that you or your family goes to that has a story that makes it different? Do you have a blanket that somebody made, some loving hands crocheted, knitted, or quilted for you that makes it different? Do you have a stuffed animal that somebody you really, really love gave to you? And so that makes it different, makes it special. Do you have a place your family always goes to every summer or every winter? And that uh, makes that place a little different, makes it special. It makes it holy. I want you this week to think about that and look around your house, look around and talk with your family about places or things that have stories you all tell about them that make them different, that makes you treat them differently than other things like it. That gives you an idea of what it means to treat something as holy. And we're going to talk about that in the grown-up sermon today, but you can start talking about that right now this way, thinking about things or places that you talk about with a story that makes them different. If you have something like that, I'd love to hear all about it. Because when we learn what it means that something is holy, we get a sense of how important these stories are 
in helping us define what our world is and how we understand where we see God in these special holy things. The reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. We continue our walk through the Ten Commandments during this Lenten season. Last week, we talked about putting God first and the logic by which God should be put first in our lives. This week, we have two commandments centered in the notion of holiness. So first, let's begin by talking about what holiness means, particularly in a scriptural sense. Holiness is primarily about being set apart, something different, something to be treated with different hands and a different way of approaching it than maybe other things like it. When I was in the Holy Land last January, somehow it was just last January that I had the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage, uh, the teacher for the Society for Biblical Studies who was with us, Peter Miano, explained to us the concept of sacred geography, and I'll explain what that means. This is the notion that there are places, specific points of, uh, of, of, of places around on a map where God has met people over the years, and those places are to be treated differently. They are holy sites. And so even today you go visit these sites and uh, they ha are treated differently than other places around them. Um, uh, the image you're gonna see on your screen right now is uh, not one of those places, but it's actually the entrance to a refugee camp in Bethlehem. And what I want you to pay attention to is the sign that is right next to it that says, His Holiness prayed here for peace and justice. This notion of sacred geography is so strong and in that, in that place and in the, in the Near East that even in a place where there isn't a huge history of you know, God coming down and speaking to the prophets or something like that, this was just a spot where the Pope came to pray. They have a sign there. They have an indication this place is to be treated differently for this reason. What he taught us about sacred geography was that the primary responsibility for political leadership in the ancient Near, East, ancient Near East was two things. One was stability, and sometimes at ridiculous cost, but stability of the social sort of contract. But the other main priority for leaders, political leaders in the ancient Near East was protection of holy sites, 
protection of sacred spaces. And that was one metric by which a reign or a rule was measured, was whether the holy spaces remained inviolate during uh, their reign. This points to different places being set apart and holy and sacred, something that we treat differently than other places around it. And I bring that up because these two commandments are not related to sacred geography at all. In fact, they have nothing to do with any specific point on the entire planet. These two mark holiness differently. Rather than being about a place, one is about time and one is about thinking and speech. So let's talk a little bit about what holiness looks like, not when it's related to an object or a place or something concrete, but rather to something we say or don't say and to how we mark time. First, let's talk about uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The Sabbath was the seventh day for God's people, and it was intended to be set apart, a day of rest. And maybe you're familiar with this, with, uh, this uh, concept, whether or not uh, we're familiar with the practice, we're probably familiar with the concept of a day that's set apart and set aside. And this has been uh, observed in different ways over the years by different groups, but it's still this notion that on the seventh day, uh, we treat it differently, and it's treated differently for uh, the reason that God gave us the injunction to set it aside, and so that's what we should do. In our current context, we lament much that work has bled into free time, has bled into family time, and separating out and keeping time separate from itself is a really difficult proposition. Calendars uh, feel less under our control and we feel like we're at the mercy of forces, work and otherwise, that we don't have a lot of say in. And so there's a, sort of a, a, a worldwide lament about the difficulty of keeping Sabbath because the world doesn't seem like it was made for it. So behold, I bring you tidings of great joy and good news. That's always been true. It has always been true that honoring the Sabbath has been a counter-cultural move. At very few points in time in history has honoring Sabbath been a, uh, a, a project of a whole political unit so that everybody could participate. In most places, in most time, in most history, it has not. And so honoring the Sabbath for most of human history has been a challenge. And I'll give you an example. Uh, for two millennia now, uh, the Jewish people have, uh, have figured out how to honor the Sabbath and the diaspora in ways all over the world. But in the Roman Empire, during the time when, we've talk, when uh, Jesus was alive and uh, when we have much of our New Testament written, Honoring the Sabbath was a particular challenge because the Roman calendar did not follow a seven-day pattern. It followed a 10-day pattern. So it was not at all an easy thing for the Jewish people to follow a, a Sabbath calendar, following every seventh day, devoting it to the Lord, because the wider empirical culture did not uh, actually honor that. So I just use that as one example. There are many of ways in which the Sabbath was not an easy thing to do. So we have, uh, we have ancestors in the faith going back many, many, many years and many, many generations who would have shared our lament that Sabbath is hard. <laughs> it's really, really hard. Now, in addition, let's talk about the second commandment, this notion uh, of not using the name of the Lord our God in vain, or another way of translating that is not using the name of the Lord wrongfully. This passage has often been interpreted to mean not using the name of God in a profane way, using it in the context of profanity, for example. But uh, this is actually much deeper than that. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, for many of them, the name of God is so holy, it can't be written or said. And that's why in a lot of your Bibles, if you look at, at this passage and others, where it says the name of the Lord, you'll find it in all caps in a smaller font. Well, that's to, in, that's to prevent usage of the actual name of God, Yahweh, uh, I am that I am so that uh, it can be preserved and held apart as holy. It's that holy, it can't be said or typed or written in that way. So wrongful use of the name of the Lord our God is not actually limited to simply preventing use of it in you know, the words you shouldn't hear on television or something like that. It goes much deeper than that. 
wrongful use of the name of the Lord our God is using the name of God to baptize an agenda. It's using the name of God to bless an idea or an action which may have nothing to do with God. It's bringing the name of God in after the fact to say, hey, look, uh, we, we said the name of God along with this other idea, therefore this other idea is an okay one. That's not what it is. Rightful use of the name of the Lord our God is in prayer, is in holy conversation with others who are seeking to do the will of the living God and submitting themselves in prayer and fasting and reading of scripture to see exactly what that is. That treats the name of God as holy. It's less about this list of words you shouldn't see in media. It's far more about knowing uh, what, what is human and what is divine and not using God's name as a justification for actions that may have absolutely nothing to do with God's intentions for us in the world. Both the Sabbath and the name of God are to be considered holy, set apart. The Sabbath is time set apart. The name of God is a word set apart. Here's the good news. Because these uh, the, this time of Sabbath and this name of God are not tied to a specific spot on the map, are not tied to a, 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 a spot where God has showed to, up to a prophet or to talk to somebody in some time, some place. These are portable. They're eminently portable. We can honor or struggle with the Sabbath wherever we are. We can honor or struggle with the name of God wherever we are. It is not tied to a geography. It isn't tied to the temple in Jerusalem or here or anywhere else. We can follow them wherever we are. This is made for a wandering people. This notion of Sabbath and this notion of the name of the Lord being holy, this is made for a people in the wilderness seeking manna every day. Here's the challenge. We can follow these commandments wherever we are. We can be anywhere on the world and trying to honor Sabbath or struggle with it or honor the name of the Lord or struggling with it. We can, so we must. Wherever we find ourselves today, wherever you are, that is the place to consider Sabbath. That is the place to honor the name of the Lord our God. It is not tied to geography. It is tied to our existence as followers of the Lord our God and Jesus Christ. To consider something holy is to recognize that it's something different. It's a different of kind, not degree. It's something set apart, something we have to regard carefully with gentle fingers and considerate hands. To be people of Sabbath and to be people who honor the name of the Lord our God is a demand and also a gift because we can do it wherever we are. And so we need to figure out how. Amen. Chosen one to rise above the din.
during the season of Lent, we are invited to put first things first and to name what is holy. May this holy God, who loves us more than we could ever name or know, meet you in your life this week. Amen.